so it is, I became a lord of cinder. I may be but small, but I will die a colossus. Hey there, my name is Alex, I am the Silvermont, and welcome to another episode of Dark Souls Lore. Third game again today, and we're going to be talking about Ludlith of Courland, the diminutive Lord of Cinder. A physically small character who doesn't have much to do in the game, yet still plays an extremely important role in spite of that. And he is a character with many bizarre and interesting theories surrounding him, but we'll start off by talking about what we know for certain. One would hope that includes his name, Ludlith of Courland. If Ludlith is a real name, it's not one that I am familiar with, but if you have anything to share there, please do down in the comments. But how about if we break it up into Lud and Lith? Well, Lud is a term used to address a judge in court, seemingly connected with Lord. If nothing else, that's appropriate, given that he is a Lord of Cinder. And purely as an interesting coincidental connection, Sullivan's title is, effectively, Law Lord, which isn't too dissimilar from a judge. There is also a Lud or Lud in the Bible and the Ludime people. I am also told that Lud can mean crazy or mad in Bosnian and people or folk in Polish. I'm sure it means many other things in many other languages, but to me, the Lud Lord connection is the most relevant. So, how about Leth? In Irish and Celtic languages, one possible meaning of leith or leth seems to be breadth, width, half. So I suppose you could jig these words around to come up with lord half or half lord. One problem here is when you are researching etymology in this manner, you can fall into the trap of finding what you were looking for rather than what is actually there, so take it all with a grain of salt. And then we have Courland. This is a real place in Latvia. Off the top of my head, there aren't many examples of souls locations sharing names with real world locations, but I'm going to take a wild leap and assume this isn't the same place. That said, there's a curious thing to remark on here. Long ago, a pagan tribe known as the Kurs or Coronians settled in Kurland. Subsequently, a chivalric order known as the Brethren of the Sword subdued and converted the Coronians to Christianity. I'm not saying there's any link here or anything like that, but that does rather put me in mind of the Ringed City. Just replace a few words and you get the Pygmies settled in the Ringed City and were subsequently conquered and converted to Gwyn's religion, the Way of White or whatever you want to call it. Back to the name, however. Kerr sounds very close to cur, the French for heart, but other than that I've found nothing too relevant. That about does it for his name, but whilst writing that I got to thinking, is Ludlith a pygmy? Prior to the release of Dark Souls 3 and The Ringed City, I was under the assumption that all humans were pygmies, for a pygmy is effectively a small person, and from the perspective of Gwyn's race, Artorius, Gwyn, Ornstein and so forth, humans are half their size. There were very few, if any, instances of the word pygmy being used in item descriptions in Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2. And item descriptions are the primary way I would research the original Japanese, a language I do not speak, I have to point out, but even basic translations can give interesting insight. As of the Ringed City, however, we have the Crucifix of the Mad King, which talks directly about the Pygmy race, and after I looked up some terms and items and did a little translating, it appears to me that Lilith refers to himself as a dwarf, and this is the same term used for Pygmies in the original. Long story short, unless I am very much mistaken, Ludlith is certainly a Pygmy, albeit one from Courland not the Ringed City. But who knows, maybe he was originally from the Ringed City. If you know more about Japanese and its usage in the games, feel free to correct me down in the comments, but keep this tentative connection with the Ringed City and Pygmies in mind for a bit later on in this video. So who is Ludlith of Courland? 
I am Ludless of Corland. Look not in bewilderment, as I say. I linked the fire long ago, becoming the Lord of Cinder. The very goal of Dark Souls 3 is to gather the Lords of Cinder so you might link the fire. Ludlith is the only Lord of Cinder to keep to his duty, in that he remains in Firelink Shrine, awaiting his end. In essence, Ludlith is there to guide the Ashen One, but he never does so in a heavy-handed way. Unlike Yuria, he does not employ you to do this or that, merely to choose your own fate, seize it with your own hands. But is there more to him and his motivations than meets the eyes? So it would seem. An old transposing kiln from Corland, crafted with stitched crystal lizard hide, give to Ludleth, a Lord of Cinder, to conduct soul transposition. This kiln can transpose twisted souls to craft special items with their concentrated essence, deemed forbidden by those unable to make proper use of it. This curious item can be obtained from the undead settlement, itself a place for exiles and outcasts, and once given to Ludleth, it allows the player to craft weapons and spells from the twisted souls of boss characters. But look again at that description, deemed forbidden by those unable to make proper use of it. If we go back to the first game, transposing souls was the work of the giant blacksmith to the gods. Over the generations, however, this art found its way into the hands of men, such as Strayed Volavis from Dark Souls 2, not to mention Ornifex, a crow harpy. Could it be that the secrets of the gods were handed down to men that way? As you'll no doubt recall, artifacts ruinous to the gods were locked away in the painted world of Ariamis, wherein we found the original harpies. Ornifex tells us, I create all manner of equipment using an ancient technique unique to my people. Ludlith himself remarks on the ominous nature of transposition, suggesting it is frowned upon. Before I was a Lord of Cinder, I was a student of transposition, the process of extracting and coalescing the essence of a soul, a forbidden art that once left a foul stain upon Corlin's honour. Tis an art that grants powers once thought unattainable. Most transposing kilns were lost with Corland, but this place is a crossing for all manner of cursed objects. In transposing a twisted soul, its true power transferreth to thee. Thy purpose is to seek lords and slay them. What's to fear in a little transposition now? But here is where things get a little bizarre. Tin foil hats on its weird theory speculation time. Have a look at the transposing kiln. Stitched from crystal lizard hide, it vaguely reminds me of Filianor's egg, and her egg also bore somewhat of a resemblance to the vagrants from the first Dark Souls, on a mostly unrelated note. But although the resemblance is passing, it got me thinking, what does Filianor's egg represent? Even if we don't know exactly what it is, we know what the egg represents. The trigger to phase between the Ringed City and the Endscape of Dark Souls. Whether they are separate realities, worlds, timelines, or whatever else, we know that there are two versions of the Ringed City the version we fight our way through, and the destroyed, crumbled version that we find ourselves in after Filianor wakes up. Where else in Dark Souls 3 do we find two seemingly parallel locations or worlds? Why, the untended graves, of course. The eyes show a world destitute of fire, a barren plain of endless darkness, a place born of betrayal. So I willed myself, Lord, to link the fire, to paint a new vision. What is thine intent? Seeming to represent a dark version of the real world, just what are the untended graves? Past? Future? I do not know. None of us can. But consider this. 
the inhabited bright firelink shrine that we make home throughout our journey. It is not physically connected to any other part of the game world. You warp from Firelink Shrine to the High Wall of Lotharic, yet if you journey through the High Wall and Lotharic Castle, you can reach the untended graves after defeating Oseros. Now, what does that suggest to you? Is our Firelink Shrine a fabrication, an illusion maintained by Ludlith? There is some precedent. Gwendolyn maintained a powerful illusion over Anna Londo, and of course there is Fleanor who appears to be maintaining the ringed city in a dream or illusion. Miyazaki must have still had Bloodborne in his system. If the ringed city is Fleanor's dream, what does that make Firelink? Ludlith is very much awake, although he can lapse into a Gehrman style fit should you kill him. Ah! It cincheth to the bone. It hurts. Please help me. Be done with me. No, God, no. I cannot bear it. It burns, burns. Help me. Speak to him again following this, and he apologizes, stating that he must have dozed off for a spell and how curious it is the language he chose, that he wished to paint a new vision. Perhaps our filing shrine is the painted world of Ludlith. Either way, even if we don't know exactly what is going on with the untended graves and filing shrine, it seems plain enough what Ludlith wishes for, to link the fire, to maintain the age of fire through any means possible. In a way, he is directly opposed to the painter girl and slave knight Gale, as she wishes to create a cold and dark world. I do not believe there is a right or a wrong option, we can only follow our hearts. And is an illusion truly so bad? A construction of a facade, and yet a world full of warmth and resplendence. I am a lord. A wee flame, belike, but I shoulder the world. Forgive me, I am not to blame, I am not.